We need to finish and then we're going to create a, a conclusion and hopefully this whole thing, this whole write-up will be the model for you to be able to use throughout the rest of the year so you can be able to start doing these things on your own rather than spending several lab periods uh, creating it every time. Okay, so uh, the last thing that we needed to do was determine a percent yield. And what was our, our last step? What was the number of the last step? 27. 27, wow. Determining percent yield. When I'm determining a value of something, I'm usually going to have some kind of a formula, just as we did with the beginning, and can I get one of you to shut the door for me there? Just as we did with the Graham's thing, I need a procedure to tell me how to uh, accomplish this. And it's easier to work with grams than it is with, to, work, to, to work with balls. Uh, but it should turn out the same. If I were to say the percent yield based on the number of moles, right? The percent yield is an amount of particles. The number of moles is an amount of particles. So the percent yield based on the amount of particles should work out to be the same as the percent yield based on the number of grams. Working the number of grams is a lot easier, though. So we're going to uh, do that. What would I want to say uh, as, is a formula that will determine the percent yield for me? What is the percent yield again? Remember, I'm supposed to get a certain amount, but I got a different amount. Would you take your exact amount and divide it by the actual amount? That would give you more than than a hundred percent. So yeah, I want to take the yeah, I want to take the so write out the percent yield formula. And this is typically something you would have in a data table, right? Write out the percent yield formula, and you're going to say percent yield equals amount, or we're going to say grams obtained divided by grams expected. times 100, right? Grams obtained divided by grams expected times 100. That'll give me the percent yield. And we'd like it to be 100%, right? We would like the amount that we got to be exactly how much we expected. We'd like the amount we got to be more than the amount that we expected, right? But that's not going to happen. So how did we figure out the amount obtained? How did we figure out the amount uh, that we obtained? We just masked it, right? We just masked the amount that we had. We have this little data table up here somewhere. Oops, wrong way. And we should probably add something to the data table down here that says percent yield equals grams obtained divided by grams expected. Mm -hmm. Times 100. How many grams? 
so I'm just going to do this for one of you. Uh, what was, uh, Aspen, what was the mass of the precipitate in your group? Uh, 6.87. 2.87. 2.87. 2.87. 2.87. 2.87. 2.87. 2.87. 2.87. 2.87. 2.87. 2.87. 2.87. 2.87. 2.87. 2.87. 2.87. 2.87. 2.87. 
equals moles expected times molar mass. Okay, so, and that's why I like this, this process of, of sort of thinking about this as a, as a whole group. We're coming up with things that, that uh, we should probably include uh, on our own. We're not just depending on Marshall to say everything, okay? So you, that's a great idea. Grams expected equals moles expected, but it's still the same formula, right? Grams equals moles times molar mass, okay? So if you do not have expected, grams expected, write out gram formula. Grams expected equals moles expected times molar mass. Um, determine moles expected from balanced chemical equation. Okay, this is one of the single most important points of the whole laboratory. Okay, how do I know what I am expected to get? How do I know what I'm expected to get? If I go back up to my, and I'll go back so you can finish writing it. But if I go back up to my balanced chemical equation, this is everything for us. If I start with one mole of this, I'm supposed to get one mole of this because that's what the balanced chemical equation says. There's a one there. It's an invisible one, and there's an invisible one there. My balanced chemical equation tells me how many moles I'm supposed to get. But if I start with 0.1 moles of this, then I should get point one moles of this. How many moles of lead acetate did we actually start with? We figured that out in our data table, didn't we? Okay, so moles of lead acetate equals Molarity times liters. We started with, we wanted a 0.1 molar and we wanted 0.1 liters of it. So 0.01 times 0 .01, uh, 0.1 times 0.1 gave us 0.01 moles. So if I started with 0.01 moles, I should get 0.01 moles of this. So this is how my balanced chemical equation helped me determine the number of moles expected. So now I can go back down here and in my data table, let me rewrite this. Grams expected equals moles expected times molar mass. Now I know what my grams expected is, or my, my moles expected was. That's 0.01 moles. And I also gave you the molar mass. Oh, I didn't give you the molar mass of potassium iodide, did I? You did. Oh, I did of potassium iodide, but not of lead iodide. You did both. Or 379.24. Oh, yeah, that's how you calculate the That's the lead acid. Oh, so how much was it? For the lead acid, it's got to be 379.24. But we're not doing lead acetate. What is it that we, we got? We got lead iodide, didn't we? Yeah, we got oh. lead moles. Or actually, we did get the right moles. We got the right moles, but we didn't get the, the molar mass yet. So. Determine moles expected from balanced chemical equation. Determine right. Determine molar mass. Okay. 
determine molar mass. In, and I'm just going to say determine molar mass in usual way. So now I'm going to have to write this down. Molar mass of lead iodide. Right, because this is our precipitate. I didn't give you this molar mass. Molar mass of lead is 209 or 207. I think it's 209, isn't it? Somebody look up the molar mass of lead for me and the molar mass of iodine. What's that? 207.2. Oh, 207 for, okay, so 207.2 for lead plus two times molar mass of iodine. Uh, I'm getting 120 what? 0.90. Okay, so now somebody calculate 207 plus 253.8 Four hundred sixty point six. Or I'm sorry. No, uh, 461. Okay, so two times 126 is 253.8, right? 253.8 plus 207 is going to give me 461. So 461 grams per mole. So we plug that back into our molar mass here. And I'm just going to move my decimal places uh, two points to the left, right? So I get 4.61 grams. Okay. I expected 4.61 grams. <laughs> You got 3.9? That's not super close. It's closer than 2.87, but it's not super close. So 3.9 is close to 4.6? Not really. So what, what what was your percent? Okay. Let's well, not like ninety five percent. Okay, so let's make sure we have all our procedural steps correct.
Okay, so our process was write out the percent yield formula. We inspected the formula to see if we had all the information. The information that we wouldn't likely have is the grams expected, right? So if you do not have grams expected, write out that formula. Grams expected equals moles expected times molar mass. Well, wait a minute. I don't have moles expected, so I can determine moles expected from the balanced chemical equation. And we did that. We found out that we needed 0.01 moles because that was the same as the number of moles of the reactant. We determined the molar mass of lead iodide. We plugged the moles and molar mass to find the grams expected. We plugged the grams expected in, uh, obtained and expected in to find the percent yield. Okay, and all of that should be in a data table somewhere, okay? So one of the things that you will learn to do then is as you create your procedure, your procedure is going to help you figure out what you need to put in the data table, okay? As I created the procedure, the first thing in the procedure said, make these solutions. Well, how do I make these solutions? I have to know how many grams to use to accomplish that. So in order to make those solutions, my procedure directed me to say, I need to put this in a data table. How do I make those solutions? How do I find out what those so the number of grams are. Grams equals moles times molar mass. Well, do I have no moles? No. Moles equals molarity times liters. Did I have molarity in liters? Yes, I gave you that information. So I could figure out what these two masses were. The procedure directed us to do this. The next place the procedure directed us to create some data was to figure out how much precipitate I got. And in order to do that, I had to write out the mass of the unused filter paper, the mass of the filter paper with the dry precipitate, and then the mass of the precipitate. The table, okay? The procedure directs that. Now, a lot of times you'll find out that when you get into a laboratory situation, you have to kind of work back and forth between the procedure and the data table. Or you have to work back and forth between messing around with the equipment and creating the procedure. A lot of times you don't know what your procedure is going to be until you actually see the equipment and really sit down and think about the process. I will always make it when we have a lab so that you have an opportunity to create a reasonable procedure and if there's something that's not going to be totally obvious to you by looking at the equipment or by uh, reading through the, the, the uh, pre-lab stuff, I will make sure that you're aware of that information and so, so that you'll know how to create a procedure. Okay. Again, I don't expect perfection until near the end of the year. This is going to be an evolving process. But hopefully by the time we get through everything at the end of the year, you'll have a really, really good idea how to create lab write-ups so that when you go into chemistry in college, if you go into chemistry in college, and I realize that, that a lot of you aren't going to, that's not where you're headed, uh, but, but by that time, uh, hopefully some of these other skills will transfer into uh, other things that, that you might have need of. So any questions about the procedure here? Okay, so we have one last thing to do then, and that's create a conclusion. And hopefully we can accomplish that by the end of class, because I really am tired of this, <laughs> this, this lab. Uh, determination of percent yield of a precipitation reaction was our title. And I changed our purpose a little bit. What we ended up doing in this was we used this to learn how to write a lab report and develop skills in preparing solutions, 
right? We develop some skills in preparing solutions. In separation of mixtures, right? We used a filter to separate the mixture, and then we de developed skills in learning how to determine the percent yield of a chemical reaction. So this is something that we'll have available to us throughout the rest of the year. These are things that we'll have in our, our toolkit, okay? We do need to write down all of the materials that we used, okay? So trying to put them in somewhat of an order in the, the, the way that we use them, the first thing we did was made solutions, right? So what, what things did we need in order to make our solutions? Okay, so we needed a, a, a balance, and so we'll say the electronic balance. Okay, what do we usually put on an electronic balance so that we don't get crap all over it? Weight paper. And we just used a sheet of paper. Uh, they actually have a special type of, of wax coated paper for that that we could buy, but it's it's more expensive than we want, so we just use regular paper. Uh, and then what did we weigh on it? So lead acetate. And it would be good to write out the name and the chemical formula, PVC2H3O2. And then what was the other reactant? Potassium iodide. Potassium iodide. Potassium iodide. Doesn't start with decay. Right on the table in here. Okay, what did we what else did we use to make the first solution? Uh, the spatula. Oh, okay. So we needed a spatula. Forgot about that, thank you. What else? So the lead acetate, we used the volumetric flask. Here we go. Or no, we did the volumetric flask. Okay, we used the volumetric flask. Or yeah. And how how big was it? What was its volume? Uh, Hundred milliliter volumetric flask. Okay. Okay, so we needed two 250 milliliter Erlenmeyer flasks. We are like a 500 milliliter beaker as well. Okay, what did we have in the 500 milliliter beaker? Just water. water. Was it a 500 milliliter beaker? We don't have 500 milliliter beakers. It was actually a 400 milliliter beaker. Okay, and then what else? Uh, the other one that we did was uh, And we just put water in that, right? What kind of water did we say we should have used? Deionized. We used tap water. We should have used the ionized water. And again, the reason that we should have used that is because tap water has lots of chlorine in it. And anytime I try to dissolve something that has lead in it, the lead reacts with the chlorine and forms a precipitate called lead chloride. And uh, it's what gave it that kind of white, cloudy appearance. And it did really decrease our yield by enough for us to worry about. Uh, but uh, uh, it would be an issue that you would want to talk about in your conclusion, maybe. What else did we use? Graduated my pad. Okay, and what size was that? 25. 25 milliliter. I graduated. Like that. And 
that the ball. Oh, yeah, we used to pipe that bulb, right? Yeah. Ooh. You said the ball? Who said that? Oh, good job. Thank you. <laughs> and then we also, I heard someone say the disposable pipe bet. <laughs> what else did we need? Funnel and the filter picture. Okay. Funnel. Oops, and filter paper. I also use an oven too, right? Okay, we should have used the oven, or we would have if we'd have had time, but we just let it air dry. So let's call that a drying oven. Is that it? Okay. Throw in goggles and well, that would generally you don't put that. You just put that in the yeah. first step. Okay. So when you actually sit down and do this and try to think about this, a lot of stuff comes together. What you just did in lab, when you simply even just write out all the materials, it's like, oh yeah, I used that. Oh yeah, I used that. Oh yeah, we did that. And it, it really kind of pulls a lot of stuff together. Okay? But it's tedious and it's time consuming and it's annoying at the same time. So I understand one of the things that I hated the most about my college chemistry laboratory was writing all this stuff down. The documentation is really, really annoying. And even though the trend is towards more electronic kinds of ways of recording things in a real laboratory a lot of times you're still going to be required to write this stuff down as opposed to typing it out why might that be why might it be more important for us to literally write all this stuff down than type it into a computer because yeah. when you write it, it goes in the mind. Okay, well, that's a, that's a good point. That's one thing. But as far as documentation goes, what can you do to electronic data that you can't really do to handwritten data? Read it all. You can steal and publish the letter okay. you're online. Okay, well, that's true, too. <laughs> but you can't fake it. There's, there's, uh, you can't go back and change things after the fact. There's a, a way that you're supposed to do things. If I had this list of stuff here and I said, oh, wait a minute, it wasn't a 300 or 400 milliliter beaker, it was a 1,000 a milliliter beaker, you can't go back and erase this. That's basically illegal. It's not really illegal, but it's unethical. I need to keep this here, and what I need to do is put a single line through it and then write the thing down that I'm supposed to use, and I'm supposed to initial it and then date it. Okay, so Writing things down makes it much more difficult to go back and change after the fact, and it makes it more difficult for you to cheat on things. So it's, it's unethical to go back and erase things or cross it out so no one can read what you put originally. Okay? So I don't know how long that will continue, but if you work in a real laboratory at some point in time, you're probably going to have to get used to writing everything in a laboratory notebook rather than typing it into a computer. Okay. Although the way the trends are going, uh, did you guys have to learn how to write cursive when you were in grade school? Yeah. 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 Okay. So, but, but they're not doing that anymore, are they? 
Rite Aid thinks Rite Aid thinks is a problem anymore. Okay, let's let's knock out a conclusion here. Okay, we have four main paragraphs to our conclusion, right? We have four main things that we want to talk about. Our first paragraph says, this is what we did. This is what we found. This is what we did. This is what we found. Okay? This is what we did. This is what we found. Our second paragraph talks about the chemistry of what you did. The third paragraph talks about the possible sources of error. And the fourth paragraph is a summary that says, this is what I learned. In conclusion, I learned this. Okay? So, what did we do? This is what we did. This is what I did. What did we do? What's the title say that we did? Okay. We determined the percent yield of a precipitation reaction okay but we want to we want to add a little bit more information here than what we added in the title. We determine the percent yield of a precipitation reaction. Specify which precipitation that. reaction did? Yeah, I want to add in the fact that it wasn't just any old precipitation reaction. I want to tell you what the precipitation reaction was. So how might we say that? We determine the percent yield of precipitation reaction. Um, well, that's right. Okay. The precipitation reaction between or of something. Okay. The precipitation reaction resulting from the addition of a let's let's even be more specific resulting from the addition of 0 0.1 liters of a 0.1 molar solution of Lead acetate so we determine the percent yield of the precipitation reaction resulting from the addition of 0.1 liters of a 0.1 molar solution of lead acetate and 0 0.1 liters of a 0.2 molar solution of potassium iodide, right? This tells us exactly what we did, right? I did this. We determined the percent yield of the precipitation reaction resulting from the addition of 0.1 liters of a 0.1 molar solution of lead acetate and 0.1 liters of a 0.2 molar solution 
of potassium iodide. I did this. We found this. We found okay. What kind of information might I want to put into that? We found. And, uh, I guess the process didn't have a full yield. Okay. We found that we only had the two chemicals right now for some years. Okay. So. I would like to put that we did a chemical equation. We found the molars that both. That would go into the chemical, you know, the chemistry part. Okay. I want. I just want to. In the first paragraph, I just want to tell people this is what we found. We we did this and we found this. Do I want to put in anything about what we expected to find? Yeah. Okay. So. And, and you can, again, you can write this in a thousand different ways, right? If I sat down and wrote this out again tomorrow, I would, I would put different words in here. Uh, we, what's that? We expected 4.61 grams of precipitate occurring from the reaction. Okay. Is there, is there a better word than expected? Is that what you asked? Uh, no, I'm just switching it around. Like, oh. Instead of, uh, uh, instead of how they expected, uh, well, yeah. Okay. So maybe we want to put that in a little bit of a different way. Sorry about that. Although. Sorry. Although we expected. And how many grams was it? 4.61 grams. And let's say a bright yellow precipitate. Although we expected 4.61 grams of bright yellow precipitate we we found let's see we produced, we produced okay good job we produced and this would be where you put in your own number of grams. Okay, we produced grams. We produced blank grams for a yield of. Of uh, for a yield of this percent. Okay. Okay. This is really pretty simple, right? We just this is what we did. This is what we found. Okay. This is what we did. This is what we found. That's all you need to say in that first paragraph. Okay. This is what we did. This is what we found. Four. 
Oh, there's the back. <laughs> yeah, I can go in the back. You what? Yeah, there's a lot on the back. I know. Okay, obviously I probably gave you a little bit more than we need to. But this is what we did, this is what we found. Any questions about that? This is how all of your uh, things should read. Now, this is not all of what our purpose was, was it? We also had a purpose of we wanted to learn about making solutions. We wanted to learn about separating mixtures. We wanted to learn about how to create a percent yield. All of that stuff will be a part of your conclusion that says, uh, in conclusion, we did this, but we also, uh, you know, while we accomplished this percent yield thing, we also learned about how to do, you know, these procedures and things. Okay? So, in the second paragraph, we need to talk about the chemistry of, of this. We need to talk about the chemistry of this. And we said that uh, the type of reaction that we had was a, um, a double, uh, double replacement reaction. It's also called a precipitation reaction. Um, so we're going to need to, to talk about that. And I guess a good place to start would be by simply saying what the, the chemical reaction was. And so uh, Aspen asked that question, are we going to say uh, anything about the specific chemical reaction? So in this second um, uh, uh, part of this, and I'm going to direct this a little bit more, uh, we need to say we... Uh, we did this chemical reaction, so we might just start off by saying uh, the chemical reaction, the chemical reaction forming the basis of our procedure. Yeah. Yeah. Is and then you can put a call in there if you want, or you can just leave it. Uh, is PB C two H three O two plus two K I gives us lead iodide plus potassium. Oops, I don't need to erase C two H three O two. Okay, so the chemical reaction forming the basis of our procedure is this. Okay, and we've called this a double replacement reaction. We've also called it a precipitation reaction. And we also said that we should say what the state is. That's an AQ there. I should put, after this, I should put a little AQ there for aqueous. I should also put a little AQ here for aqueous. Okay, that means it's in solution, right? Aqueous means that it's in solution. We should put an S here for solid after the lead acetate, or after the lead iodide, and then aqueous again here. Okay? Uh, isn't the uh, test acetate have a two before it? Oh, you're right. Thank you. Right. Okay. And one of the one of the next things that we're going to learn how to do is balance chemical equations thoroughly. Okay. Okay. So the chemical reaction forming the basis of our procedure is this. 
This is a double replacement reaction in which this is a double replacement reaction in which we change the cations, okay? We're going to switch the lead for potassium, and that's exactly what we did, right? We switched the lead for the potassium. So this is a double replacement reaction in which the two cations switch oops. anions. Okay, that's what all double replacement reactions are going to be. I'm going to have an ionic compound here, and I'm going to have an ionic compound here. And any time I have that situation, if I write that equation out, the expectation is going to be that the two cations switch anions. Okay? The two cations are going to switch to anions. This usually results in this usually results in one of the products being insoluble and precipitating out. Okay? This usually results in one of the products being insoluble and precipitating out. So I'm telling my audience or whoever might read this what the chemistry of this is. Why is this happening? In this type of a reaction, whenever I get two ionic solids or two ionic substances that are dissolvable, and both of these are dissolvable because I've said they're both dissolvable, right? Anytime I add them together, I'm likely to get a new substance that precipitates out. What happens to the other substance? It stays dissolved, right? It stays in solution. Okay? This usually results in one of the products being insoluble and precipitating out while the other if you wanted to, could you precipitate the other one out? It wouldn't work. The, the, so if I have two substances here that are going to always dissolve, right? Both of these substances are always going to dissolve. Only one of them will actually end up precipitating out. The other will still form a substance that will always stay in solution. Unless it's a doctor. Well, if you evaporated it, then it would come out of solution, right? So, yeah, if I separated the lead iodide out, and then I let the remaining uh, substance evaporate, then I would end up with a bunch of potassium acetate that's solid. Yes, exactly. So, and precipitating out while the other remains in solution. Okay, well, the, uh, so this is a double replacement reaction in which the two cations switch anions. This usually results in one of the products being insoluble and precipitating out while the other remains in 
solution. Okay. So our goal in this reaction was to determine the percent yield. Um, so what we could then say is something about, we've already said as much as we need to say about the reaction itself. Okay. Um, now I want to say something about how we figure out what the percent yield is. Okay. We can determine the percent yield of such a reaction by evaluating the, and I'm going to use uh, a word that I think we've probably used once so far this year. When I look at the study of figuring out how many moles of one thing reacts with the number of moles of the other thing, does anybody remember what that study is called? Stoichiometry. Okay? We look at the stoichiometry. Uh, so we can determine the percent. Oh, I should have put the word yield in there, right? Okay, sorry about that. Okay. We can determine the percent yield of such a reaction by evaluating the stoichiometry of the balanced chemical equation. Okay. We can determine the percent of such a uh, percent yield of such a reaction by evaluating the stoichiometry of the balanced chemical equation. Knowing the number of moles, knowing the number of moles of either reactant used Okay, that's what we did, right? I could I could do this, I could figure this out knowing either that this is one mole or this is two moles. I could say the number of moles of this has to be one half of the number of moles of this, right? If this is a one and this is a two, the number of moles of this would be one half of the number of moles of this. So I could ask you to figure this out using the number of moles of either of the reactants. Or I could have found out how many moles of this I got, right? I could have did, uh, done what Garrett suggested and evaporated all of this solution and found out how many moles of this that I was supposed to get and figured out how many moles of this I was supposed to have. If I have two moles of this, I'm supposed to have one mole of this. So this is why we need a balanced chemical equation so I can do all kinds of things with this stoichiometry. I can figure out everything I need to know about this by knowing something about this or knowing something about this or knowing something about that. Okay? So, knowing the number of moles of either reactant, the number of moles of product expected can be determined. OK, 
Okay? Knowing the number of moles of either reactant, the number of moles of product expected can be determined. Okay, knowing the number of moles of either reactant, the number of moles of product expected can be determined. This can then be used to find the number of grams expected. Dividing the number of grams obtained by this will give the percent yield. Okay, so knowing the number of moles of either reactant, the number of moles of product expected can be determined. This can then be used to find the number of grams expected. Dividing the number of grams obtained by this will give the percent yield. Okay. Have I pretty much said all I need to say about what the chemistry of this was? I think so. I could talk about how we accomplished making the procedures, but that's probably going to be more of a thing related to our possible sources of error. Okay? Dang, it's getting late, isn't it? Yeah. Are we going to write the purpose of why we did it? What's that? Are we going to write the purpose of why we did it? Like in a separate purpose? Yeah. That'll be the, the conclusion part of the part of it. Okay? So, and you'll find that, that in this particular case, one part of what we did is more appropriate in one of the paragraphs, and in another circumstance, it might be more appropriate in one of the other, uh, other paragraphs. Okay? But... Not yet. We've got to finish it. So we've still got a little bit more. Is this is the way that we're doing this making any sense? Is this I thought your mom is this gonna be useful for future labs maybe? Or it just really sucks and I don't really care. That's okay. We're waiting until we're completely done. No, not right now. I want all of it handed in at once. Okay, you guys are awesome. This is this is uh, uh, this is hard, but you're doing a great job. Yeah.